Our next panel uh, is talking about branding at the dispensary level. And as you know, um, in some markets, there's not a lot of dispensaries. And so, you know, you really have a limited choice. But we have other states where there are loads of dispensaries. And so it starts to get really competitive as to bringing in the consumer into your dispensary. And how that dispensary looks and feels, you know, really identifies who you are and could make the difference between someone walking in your door versus uh, the one next door. I know in some uh, municipalities it's very limited where you can locate dispensaries, so they all end up clustered together, and so that's also an issue. Right now, uh, this panel is going to talk about that, about really creating your identity and your brand at the dispensary level. And Brian Lavre, he is with uh, MMLG, which is a cannabis consulting firm. He's going to be moderating this panel. I'm gonna let him take it from here and introduce our guest. Thank you so much, uh, sorry. Thank you so much, Deborah. Uh, welcome everyone. We hope you're having a great time at Green Market Summit so far. Uh, thank you again for attending our panel. Uh, my name is Brian, as Deborah explained. I work with MMLG. Uh, we're based in Los Angeles, but I live in New York, so you're welcome for all of the stereotypes about New Yorkers wearing black constantly. Um, to, my, to my right, to your left, yeah, that, that's how it works. I'm, with, I'm joined by Blythe as well as Eric. Eric is the CEO of Jushi, and Blythe, um, why don't you lead first, explain your role with Jushi as well as Beyond Hello, and uh, we'll just get started. Hi. Hello, uh, Blythe Eustace here. I am the VP of Retail Operations for Jushi. Um, I oversee a dispensary named Beyond Hello, and I first started my career actually in Arizona in 2010, Prop 203 uh, passed for medical cannabis, and I joined a group there uh, and spearheaded the opening of multiple dispensaries in Arizona. Uh, worked in that market for several years, and in late uh, 2017, actually joined a new group who had permits to open up dispensaries in Pennsylvania. So I relocated to Pennsylvania, and um, at that point, the, the first project that um, I was in charge of was developing a name, uh, an identity, and a brand for a dispensary, and that was Beyond Hello. Thank you so much. Uh, excuse me. Thank you so much, Blythe. Uh, Eric, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself, explain how you got into cannabis, if you'd like? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Eric Mauf. I am the president and co-founder of Jushi. We're a multi-state operator. We have operations in Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, Ohio, Las Vegas, and in California. Uh, so I had a, a non-traditional path into cannabis. I was uh, uh, 25 years on Wall Street. I retired four years ago. Uh, we have been investing into the cannabis space privately. And, you know, I'd say over the last four or five years, have really seen how large and, and complicated this business is. And two and a half years ago, uh, elected to actually start our own multi-state operator. We thought there was a tremendous uh, lack of uh, highly qualified uh, management teams the market needed to consolidate, and we thought it was a, a great time to raise capital and consolidate into the sector. And it's been a it's been a fantastic uh, journey so far. Thank you. It's a, yeah, not a bad not bad business if you can get into it, right? Um, all right. So, anyways, folks, we're here today to talk to you about branding and marketing at the dispensary level, at the retail level. And there may be some of you out there wondering why branding, why marketing at this level, but you know, when you think about it from a consumer or from a patient standpoint, the, the retail location and the, the, the structure, the aesthetics, the vibe that you get in one of those locales is so central to what your consumer experience, to what your purchase process is like as a patient in a medical state or just as someone in an adult use state as well. And so, Blythe, why don't you walk us through why branding is so critical for you know something like Beyond Hello and how Beyond Hello sort of evolved. Sure. Um, so 
one of the first projects, as I said, was developing a brand, um, and ultimately we recognized that that's developing an identity and an opportunity to also develop something that's a differentiator. So uh, we worked with a branding company, and uh, after several hours of interviewing and asking questions, um, we came to the birthing of, of Beyond Hello. And ultimately, you know, we say it's uh, two small words, but with massive implications. Uh, beyond Hello, going beyond a hello, beyond the transaction, uh, and really starting to have open, honest dialogue and conversations with our patients, with our consumers, with the community, with medical pros. Um, and so what we, what we really did is we wanted to focus on um, the consumer and the patient and the experience. So you can have product, pricing, and people, and sometimes at our um, level, you can't really control the product or the pricing per se, but what you really can control are the people that you have representing your brand. So we've been hyper-focused on staffing, uh, hyper-focused on training, on making sure that everybody we have working for us um, are experts and know the product, uh, but also maintain um, a very strong element of customer service. So uh, really when you walk into our space, what do you feel? What's, what's your experience? And um, I genuinely believe that positivity is palpable. I think that you can walk into a space and feel the energy. So part of our job is to create a happy, healthy environment that our patients, because in Pennsylvania we're, we're medical, that our patients want to be in. Um, and really making sure that from start to finish they've enjoyed their experience because they can go somewhere else. And sure, location is incredibly important, but if somebody has a choice between two locations that are, are relatively close, they're gonna to go to the place where they know they can just have a phenomenal experience, that they're confident in their purchase, and that they were really well taken care of. Absolutely. Uh, Eric, do you mind just taking a moment as well to sort of walk us through what Jushi saw with uh, Beyond Hello and what was really sort of the process in terms of what drove you guys to, to build it out in the way that you guys have? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think, uh, you know, we've always had kind of a two-pronged strategy. Uh, one, to build businesses in the adult use markets like California and Nevada, uh, where you have, you know, really quite deep uh, product expertise and capabilities. You have great variety. You have actually a relatively con, you know, the consumer in, in, in California is quite, quite educated versus what you see out east where, you know, at this stage, places like New York and New Jersey and Pennsylvania are still very much medical markets. I'd say, you know, I still remember the first time I met Blythe, we walked into the, the first dispensary that they, they had opened in Pennsylvania. And when you walked in, you really did get a feeling that this was a lot more like a, a California-based facility. The product selection, because of the state, is actually quite forward-thinking, so the product selection is quite, quite, quite wide. Uh, Blythe really had done a fantastic job in making it feel warm and welcoming. It doesn't feel sterile, or nor does it feel overwhelming. Um, and then the staff, you know, I think this is all about training. Now, in a, in a medical market, clearly you, you have patients who have gone to a physician to get a card to treat a certain um, uh, issue they have and, and so if you have a pain uh, issue you come in for your pain so so it's really important for us at the at the at the dispensary level to to understand what the the the, the patient needs and you know I think you know when we looked at that I think we've learned a lot and we've learned a lot about the education process of what 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 we need to do within cannabis and you know quite frankly how uneducated the general consumer is on dosing, on variety, and also the various aspects that you can use cannabis in your everyday life. You don't just need it for a certain outcome. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, 
so many of us in California, or again, who work with California companies, even though we wear black and are based in New York, um, something we see is a degree of sophistication in terms of consumers, in terms of patients, in terms of what we know, but what's really difficult for us to sometimes pause and take a step back and recognize is that so much of the rest of the country is not there from an information standpoint, from an education standpoint, from a sophistication standpoint. So now Blythe, if I am John Q. Public and I'm walking into a, any Pennsylvania dispensary, um, I, may, I may be getting a different uh, experience than what I would get at Beyond Hello. Uh, why don't you walk us through some of the intricacies of Pennsylvania with regards to having medical staffers and then sort of how that helped you to mold and shape what you really thought was a patient-facing experience? So uh, Pennsylvania has a unique requirement in its medical program where you have to have a medical professional on staff during all hours of operation. Uh, so we obviously had to abide by that and be compliant. Um, but through that experience, we really identified just how valuable that is, uh, the sense of comfort that it provides to the consumer. Um, we are prepared to see everybody from the new to cannabis consumer and the experienced consumer alike, uh, but you'd be surprised. People who are that, you know, uh, experienced consumer maybe never had an opportunity to speak with a medical professional um, in a dispensary environment and ask some of those uh, questions. So it's been really fascinating seeing how even our perspective of having a medical professional professional on staff has evolved. Um, so when somebody comes into one of our stores, um, the medical professional is first checking their uh, records that are provided by the Department of Health, uh, looking at what uh, ailment they qualified for, um, understanding if there are any restrictions that a doctor in Pennsylvania has placed with regard to what products they can actually consume. Uh, and then from there, you know, we ultimately try and and understand what that patient is looking for in their experience. So if they want more of a hands-off experience and they want to wave to our medical pro and go work with one of our patient consultants, that's fine. If they want their hand held and to work side by side with the medical pro, we offer that too. Um, but in the end, you know, it's also incredibly important that our teams are able to talk through an entire um, consumption process with, with the patients and understand dosing and titrations and methods of consumption. Um, so again, I mean, it just kind of goes back to making sure that everybody is so well-trained and passionate about the product and professional um, and ultimately ensuring that the consumption is responsible. That's really insightful. Um... Something else I wonder. I'll get. I'll get back to you, Eric. Don't worry. But I have a, a follow-up question for Blythe, and, and she, I actually she's better than I am. Anyway. <laughs> I, I want your opinion on this as well. But I just want to roll with Blythe for another moment. Uh, Blythe, when we're talking about branding, and uh, you know, as we've seen in California, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania, uh, what we'll, what we will see in states like Missouri and Illinois, as they roll out their uh, plans. Uh, there's really, you know, an influx, a constant, constant influx, almost a flood of competition. Uh, it's a very crowded retail market. Uh, for Beyond Hello and for Jushi at large, what are some of the steps via the medical aspect, but other just broader branding notions that you guys have implemented to help differentiate? Sure, so I think Ultimately, what makes Beyond Hello so sticky and have this expansion ability uh, is that it's believable and it's real and it's true. Um, I genuinely believe in the brand and what our mission is. And when that's clearly conveyed to the people who are joining the organization and then they believe it and they get behind it and there are these ambassadors for your brand and they're advocates for what you're doing, then 
the patient comes in and they're talking to the employee and they can see that that employee believes it. Uh, it, it just becomes real uh, and tangible and you really, you know, can feel good about what you're doing and what you've experienced. And I think ultimately that's been the cycle that we've seen. We believe it, our employees believe it, the people they help then believe it, and then they go out to their friends and family and talk about it and um, they can feel good about what they've done because they're confident in their purchase, they're confident with who they purchased from, they know that we're curating products and making sure that we have the best products available for safe and responsible consumption. Uh, Eric, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, that was a A plus response from Blythe, but uh, Eric, I know that you, you've had a hand in this as well, so. Yeah, yeah. I, I would challenge one of your statements that you think this is an overcrowded retail market. You know, I think we take a very different stance on that. <clears throat> we actually think that this is a very underserved uh, retail market. Uh, you know, and I'm talking nationally, it's clearly state by state, there's differentials, but just across the U.S., being a multi-state operator, I look at the entire country, not just regions, although we break each region up. One, you know, I don't believe that uh, there is an abundance of safe, clean, tested, uh, uh, well-curated, highly trained staff that can really service the new customer. So if we're just going to be out there servicing the traditional stoner, who we, you know, there's the old rule that, you know, 80% of your sales is 20% of the people that come in. I think that is definitely a business model, and that's a business model I think you can pursue, and you most probably would be quite successful. If you believe that over the next decade, um, cannabis as a product and the cannabinoids within the entire spectrum of that they exist will become a much bigger part of many people's daily health regime. However you want to think of that, you know, our largest purchase at Jushi as a founding company was uh, we partnered with the largest cannabis clinic in New York and most probably the country. It's up in Buffalo, New York, run by Dr. Laszlo Metzler. Uh, Dr. Metzler is a very well-known national neurologist. It's a very large neurological practice. The cannabis clinic has been operational for four years, 9,000 patients. He was, a, he was a cannabis skeptic going in. And now he is looking at the amazing results that he sees on the, on the medical cannabis side. And so we've always felt as a company that this is not just to service the traditional users of cannabis. It's also to bring in the millions and millions of people that have abandoned this product. One, because of stereotype, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great gateway drug which is my generation. It is? Absolutely. Oh, no. I... <laughs> so that's how many of you know, people over the age of 50 or 55, that's how they grew up. They had a bad experience in college. And so dosing, uh, the way you can imbibe it. I think there's a massive amount of education that we can get people comfortable that going into dispensary is not a naughty thing to do that it should be a natural thing to do, a safe thing to do, that there are products available in our dispensaries which can help you with many different aspects. I look at myself as an example. I mean, three years ago, I was an active user of Ambien in, when I traveled. I have a tough time sleeping. I have found a much better co cocktail of cannabinoids that are far more efficient, and you know, I don't need to have that, that hangover the next day from those pharmaceuticals. And that was an education process for someone who was buying, you know, uh, a, a, a multi-state business. So I feel deeply that there is a great combination between what we're doing in a place like Pennsylvania, which is very medical orientated, but bringing that into the traditional adult use markets to allow my patients you know, young, maybe not younger people, but people in their middle age, older people, women, people who have not traditionally uh, uh, walked into a dispensary for, for, for a, a lifestyle choice. So that's really interesting. The, the concept of bias or stereotype where, you know, it's one thing for, for me to make terrible jokes about New Yorkers always dressing in black, but, you know, for cannabis patients, for cannabis consumers, there really is, uh, there's a stigma that you have to erode. Um, what do you think, and either of you should please just feel welcome to answer this, but um, how do you think that Beyond Hello and Jushi, I, I mean, we've, we've spoken at length, Blythe, about 
the pharmacists on staff. Um, what are some other steps that you think the company itself takes, but also that the industry should be aware of to, er to erode this stereotype or of a gateway drug or, you know? I mean, ultimately, it's, it comes down to education and having honest conversations about cannabis and creating a space where anybody can feel comfortable coming in and asking questions, even if they don't want to purchase something. If they want to just come in and find out a little bit more about it, like or, I could come in and just, will this get me high? And <laughs> it's a terrible question, but then sure. you, you guys would explain, well, there, there will be effects, but the, these are the effects. And it, I think there's, there's just so much to parse through. There are, there is. And Pennsylvania right now really is restricted on who can even come in the doors to ask questions, but we've really made a conscious effort of going out to um, the community and talking to medical professionals uh, and making ourselves available to somebody who maybe hasn't considered consuming to ask those questions. So I know my mom, for instance, um, she would never have stepped foot in a dispensary or consumed cannabis. To her, it was wrong. Um, and unfortunately, she passed before she could step foot in a dispensary, but I genuinely believe if she had today, uh, we could change her mind and make her more comfortable with cannabis as an option for anxiety, chronic pain, as a sleep aid, um, to assist with your appetite, nausea, and other. Um, so I really think that's what's so important, and we have such an opportunity now to start really talking to people who typically wouldn't consume cannabis about how it is safe and how you can consume it responsibly and how you can feel good about making that personal health choice for yourself. Eric, you, have, you mentioned at the top that you have kind of an interesting perspective with your, your decades of work in the finance industry. What do, you, what do you see from your perspective now in charge of, I mean, we're all in cannabis, but you guys also are in CPG to an extent. Um, what do you think? Where, where do you see this going? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say where I see it going. I just I, oh, that's fine. Yeah, tell that's you fine. a little bit about how I, I see the industry and how we're evolving as a company. You know, I've always said this, that, you know, this is going to be a $200 billion plus industry just in the United States. It's already, according to certain statistics, a 40 to $50 billion uh, uh, illegal market. And so really, what am I required to do as a, as a business person, as an operator of dispensaries? I need to create uh, a safe, clean, um, informative environment in which you can go into, one. I need to have product that is tested, with a high degree of authenticity on where it came from. So, you know, I think people have consumed cannabis for a very long time without an ability to look at the label and on that label identify all of the aspects within that product that they are consuming. Now, that's the second thing I need to do. The, the third thing I need to do is I need to comply by, by state and hopefully at some stage federal law and operate a clean, safe, tested, uh, compliant company. If I can just do those three things, I can build myself an incredible retail, um, manufacturing, processing, uh, extraction, and cultivation business that can serve the community. And I think that that community is going to evolve very quickly into looking at this as a part of their, net, their, their daily wellness regime. And so that's really how we look at it, and that's how we are building the company, that's how we're going to be building our brand. And you know, it's, it, it is, for me, a relatively easy thing to do if we just do it right. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think what's really interesting with what you're talking about, Eric, is that, you know, for a lot of our audience, for ourselves on stage, we all, to a degree, one or another degree, understand the intricacy of compliance, of licensure, of testing, but for patients or for consumers, that's all background noise. And so many of them don't necessarily understand that. They just don't have the awareness of it. Uh, Blythe, what do you think, from an education standpoint, because I know you guys 
do a, a wonderful job of hiring so many people from very diverse backgrounds, not only in terms of what you provide with the pharmacists on staff, but also in terms of hiring minorities, hiring women. Um, from an education standpoint, where do you think that plays into it? Well, first off, just to kind of discuss what, what yeah. you mentioned about uh, our staffing. Something that we've really found to be important is ensuring that the team we have in the stores represent the demographic with which they serve. Uh, so incredibly important that we are having a diverse team um, and that way they can connect directly with that patient. Uh, it doesn't seem unnatural or out of sorts for a patient to come in and you know see or find somebody working in our shops that they feel that they can instantly connect with and have a conversation with uh, and relate to. So that's a big piece. Um, and then you also discussed you know women. Um, interestingly, um, I myself am a woman, and my marketing manager <laughs> in Pennsylvania is a woman. My practitioner outreach lead is a woman. Uh, my two regional managers who oversee all operations of our facilities in Pennsylvania are women. 60% uh, of our pharmacists and medical pros on staff are women. Um, and that's not necessarily a strategy of ours. However, uh, we do see that right now the majority of of cannabis consumers are, are men, but we're seeing more and more women uh, come into our shops. And so I think it's, it's really nice too um, to be representative of the population and know that there's also just a nice bedside manner that our, our medical pros have and they can come and, and have a very organic conversation with, with the people who are, are in our stores. So. It's been interesting to see the evolution. Uh, it's been very natural and organic, uh, but incredibly important, and it makes me proud to see. Yeah, it should. I mean, that's a big deal. Um, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, guys, give it up. Come on. Uh, Blythe, I do have a question. Um, you've done two cycles in two separate states now, right? Arizona and Pennsylvania. Um, for Jushi, as well as for Beyond Hello, what are some of the hurdles that the companies themselves had, have had to work through in terms of maintaining a consistency of brand in different markets? We were talking backstage about how in Pennsylvania there's certain stuff you can and cannot have on shelves. Uh, so some similarities. I mean, it's it's... I've worked in medical um, markets, so Arizona was medical, Pennsylvania medical, so very highly regulated industries, incredibly important that you operate uh, compliantly and that you are developing strong relationships with the regulators, understanding what they want um, and providing what they want. Uh, lots of times people discuss operating in a gray area and that has never been um, what we what we do for us, it is very, you know, by the book um, and maintaining compliance at all times. So those have definitely been some similarities. Um, the purchasing trends uh, have been incredibly similar. Um, your new to cannabis consumer is typically more comfortable with a tincture or um, a topical lotion um, where your more experienced consumers can um, have hard concentrates or flour or oil cartridges cartridges. Um, so it's been very, very similar. Obviously, they have their own unique facets, but overall, very similar. The big difference that I've seen between Arizona and Pennsylvania are the products that are allowed in the program. Um, Pennsylvania currently does not allow edibles, which I think is incredibly unfortunate. Um, I second this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what's interesting too in Pennsylvania is uh, a patient can purchase product and go home and make their own edibles, and that's perfectly fine, but they cannot purchase edibles in the dispensary. So that's been a big difference, the product availability. Um, but I think it's... Uh, I think Pennsylvania will eventually have edibles. I think they'll see the, the value in it if they haven't already identified that. And it's with any new medical market, it evolves and it grows and you learn with the state uh, and make changes together. I, thank you. Um, 
Erica's medical markets do continue to evolve as well as expand. Um, I know that for Jushi and Beyond Hello, both brands are very focused uh, to one degree or another, they're focused on um, M&A as a means of expansion. Uh, would you care to, to chime in on anything from that standpoint in terms of what it's, what it's like just working behind the scenes to expand into new territories and to recognize what makes sense or versus what doesn't make sense? Yeah. Um, look, you know, I, I, I will say this, you know, having had a 25-year um, career in finance, having, you know, bought and sold billions and billions of dollars of companies, it's, it's, it's probably more challenging than I ever thought it would be. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, M&A is not easy. Well, you know, if, again, the, the, the thesis on why we came out of retirement to start this company was we felt that there was a dearth of well-managed, highly compliant companies that over time, if you built that company over the next three to seven years and you were able to have best-in-class Fortune 500 financials, compliance structures, um, team training, dispensary m management, how you did extraction and processing and packaging, high quality cultivation, if you were able to build that, that that would be a differentiated product over time. And if you look at the M&A scene, you know, there were a lot of people that got into this business for very many reasons. Uh, many people were underfunded, and so you often come across businesses that have just not been run the way you would be able to if you were to be scrutinized by a KPMG or by a, a compliant business. And so M&A is incredibly taxing. We have to spend an enormous amount of time on diligence. So let's just take a dispensary. You're gonna buy a dispensary, that's great. If it's operational, you need to make sure it's audited because I can assure you it hasn't been audited. And I'm a public company. Number two, you need to make sure that when you do your inventory analysis that the inventory in and the inventory out is consistent because if it isn't, you have an issue. And you have to make sure that the legal structure in which it was procured, either through a competitive uh, application process or another M&A process, that you have diligence that, that there's nothing in that process that may come back to haunt you over time where there may have been payments made, or there may have been other people on that application that were not appropriate. And so the amount of, 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 of really detailed diligence required to do, if that's the company you want to build, is, is actually uh, is, is, is one thing that we really underestimated. And so, you know, it's, it's hard, but, you know, we will continue to add to the portfolio over time. There are, you know, I think the, there are many good operators. I think there are many people that believe and, 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 and value the story we bring. I think they value that we have people like, like Blythe running a, an amazing business, and yet they can rely on our financial skills to raise capital, a very large legal staff. It's, it's, it's a complicated business, it's a, and it's even more difficult to do it well. Absolutely, and folks, I mean, what Eric is talking about, and this is me putting on my, I work for a cannabis consultancy hat for a moment, uh, he's touching the tip of the iceberg. We could have a completely separate panel solely on compliance regarding mergers and acquisitions within the cannabis industry. Some of you guys know this, some of you guys will learn this, hopefully, God's blessings, none of you learned this the hard way. But what Eric's talking about is 100% true. Um, anyways. You know, I, I would just say, and this, I don't want to you know, push Chushi too hard, but yeah. one of the very big fundamental differences between us as a business and many of the other multi-state operators is as, as a management team, an enormous amount of the capital is our own personal capital. Well, that's we, interesting. We thought yeah. that was really important that we align ourselves. You guys have our some investments. skin in the game. We, no, we have a lot of skin in yeah. the game. Um, and so, you know, as opposed to gifting ourselves 50% of the company, uh, we, we, are, we are deeply, deeply invested in it. And it comes a little bit from the hedge fund background that we come from. The most successful hedge funds over time have been hedge funds where the principles are a very large portion of the underlying capital because you just behave differently when it's your money oh, yeah. than when it is other people's money. And so, you know, every time I go into an M&A situation, I am putting my money, and because you all know this, most of us are funded by private capital, and that private capital has traditionally been people that Jim, the CEO, and I'm the president, 
and the board know personally. And these are people often who did not know much about cannabis, but have relied on us as successful business people to say, look, that sounds like a really interesting endeavor. And so, you know, we have a very high degree of personal responsibility to the underlying shareholders. This is not something where we went public and raised a ton of money. This is people I know who I've worked with. These are family offices. So, you know, and in that isn't also an issue because one of the issues I have with cannabis is it is unfortunately being funded by wealthy people. And yeah. there's not really an ability for the general public yet to participate in this because it's so damn difficult to invest in cannabis. It's privately. It, it's exceedingly expensive. Uh, I, I know that in California there are a lot of reasons why it's expensive. Um, and, you know, I, I was at a talk last week where one of the panelists explained not all of us are going to be owners. And that's something to bear in mind. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be that cost prohibitive. Uh, anyways, we, we could have another panel. We'll have another panel afterwards. Just talk to us in the lobby. It'll be an impromptu panel. Panel's too strong of a word. I'm digressing at this point. Um, Blythe, I do have a question for you, though. Um, circling back for a moment, uh, Eric mentioned dosing and how, and how critical correct dosing is and that, you know, particularly for new patients or new consumers who are just getting into it, you know, be it a baby boomer, someone in their 60s who, you know, had one bad experience 40 years ago in college or someone who's, you know, never tried it, whatever. Um, can you talk to us, inform us, what's it like from a retail experience for anyone going into a Beyond Hello or any, or the experience that anyone should have at any store, what's it like walking someone through a dosing uh, criteria or selection? Sure. Um, so consistent with our brand and going beyond a hello and a simple transaction, you know, those are conversations we really want to have. Uh, and we do understand that dependent on the patient, they may or may not want to discuss it, and that's that's fine. Uh, but if they want to, and uh, if we're offer, uh, able to offer our guidance, I mean, it's something that we do all the time. So um, if somebody's not asking a direct question, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're still informing that person purchasing how to use the product appropriately. Um, so dosing, uh, you've got to know how to properly use your product and it's important to understand what type of um, experience you're looking to have or what type of effects you're looking for. And for us, um, we really want to make sure that we're titrating doses up. So we will always encourage that, I'm sure most people have heard this, start low and slow. Uh, and it's true because you might come in and tell one of our, our employees, you know, oh yeah, you know, I consume all the time or I've had this, I've had that, and that's wonderful and we respect it. And so we'll make sure that we get something that works for you. But to be responsible, you know, we're going to suggest that this is the proper dose to start with, and then you titrate up um, slowly to find that sweet spot that works best for you. Um, we really recognize, too, that um, it takes really, unfortunately, one time for somebody to have a bad experience, and they will forever be turned off towards cannabis. And uh, Eric mentioned it earlier, you know, you've got a bad experience in college, and so you're going to stay away from it. So we want to offer up that information and help the consumer have um, the experience that ultimately they're looking for. So talking to the patient or the consumer about what they're looking for and knowing the products really well. I mean, this, this, this oh. You know, I, yeah. I, I, I put a, I'll take a slightly different angle, you know, being, being, you know, a founder and a manager of the company, what are the scary things that go bang at night that you worry about? You know, and I, 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 I make a parallel between our industry and the electric car industry. Um, and let's even talk about self-driving. And so you have a self-driving incident that happens and a person unfortunately dies. And all the non-believers, which are the car manufacturers of combustion engines, the skeptics out there, jump on this like, oh yeah, you know, never have self-driving. That's, that's, so we- Cars are gonna take my jobs. That's just all of that. And so yeah. we live in an industry which is new and nascent. It's developing. 
It's got tremendous capabilities for people to add it into their wellness regime. But there are a lot of skeptics. The tobacco companies are terrified of us. The alcohol companies have to be terrified of us. And the conservative non-users of, of, of cannabis who believe this is a drug want to I'm not particularly fond of us either, pharmaceutical companies, is endless. So it is absolutely critical that we manufacture highly curated products that has a chain of custody that we can defend, that has no additives in it that are going to create death by vaping, and that we teach people how to, um, how to dose themselves. I have a friend of mine who's in the audience who, when we opened up stores in... In, in, in Colorado for the first time, a reporter walked in, bought a 100 milligram edible, was told not to eat it all, ate it all, had a terrible experience, and wrote online, and that polluted. I, I'm sorry, is your friend a rhinoceros? I mean, 100 milligrams is a lot. Uh. I mean, if you don't know, I always make this, 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 this analogy, it's, it's, it's quite amazing to me, is no one would walk in and someone pour a clear liquid into an entire glass and you would just drink it. You would ask, what yeah. is it? If it's tequila, you'd drink less than more. So I think for us, from a business perspective, this is a terrifying aspect that we need to make sure we do this right because there are so many people that would like to see us fail. Absolutely. And I mean, folks, some of this might sound remedial, but you know, cannabis is having its moment. It's having a prolonged moment. But because we're having a moment, it means the spotlight is on us. And not just because we're all literally on a spotlight because we're on a stage, but because literally, you know, everyone is looking at us. And so from a scrutiny standpoint, what Eric and Blythe are talking about in terms of maintaining the tightest ship behind the scenes, in front of house, everywhere. The, these are big, big lessons that we all understand the critical importance of, not just for an individual company, but for the industry. We're all ambassadors for the industry. Um, moving to a slightly sunnier topic, um, I, I, I really want both of your perspectives on this because I know that you know there are a lot of people out there who are probably wondering, you know, if they're a smaller company, if they're a local company, what what are some steps? What are some takeaways from the the journey that Beyond Hello has seen, from the journey that Jushi has seen? Um, to becoming a larger company, to becoming a national company. If somebody wants to go national, if you want to, if you want to grow. Um, ultimately, believing in your brand and um, making sure that everybody from the bottom up believe in the brand is incredibly important. You have to have that consistency. So. We obviously want to have consistency from store to store, but even at a more granular, granular level, um, people in the store, there has to be that level of consistency. Um, you have to make sure that you are training your staff, that they know the product, that they understand what the missions and goals are, and um, they'll carry that through. So even if you are a, a small, uh, local, singular store, there's still such an opportunity because if it's a believable brand and everybody in the operation are sticking to that, that singular mission, it'll resonate and you will find that, that population that you can connect with um, and, and it'll allow you to, to expand and, and really get into um, a larger market with a larger demographic and, and have a loyal following. It's so ingrained, I feel, that with Beyond Hello and with Jushia, it's so ingrained into the company culture that customer experience comes number one. It's such a priority for, for you guys, whether it's patients in Pennsylvania, whether it's an adult use consumer in Las Vegas. Um, can either of you speak to that and sort of how you maintain that consistency and that dedication on a store, on a per store basis? Yeah, I, I'm not gonna talk about it on just a per store basis. I'm just gonna talk about it as a country, a company in general. I'd say the most remarkable thing in the last three years is the the, the quality of, uh, of person wanting to join the company. And so I'll use an example. I would never have believed three years ago that a, you know, a, a, a Harvard MBA would delay Harvard for two years 
to come work at Jushi, uh, whose mother was very disappointed that he was <laughs> working in a cannabis company and whose father was mildly supportive. But I just think, you know, I look at the quality of people that we can hire, the diversity of people we can hire, and the passion that those people have for the industry is, to me, is, is really the sea change. And if that continues to be the case, um, I think that's a real winning strategy because you need a great team on the field. And to have people like Blythe who, who can operate with this degree of integrity uh, in this business really makes me feel that you know, when I look at my, my team that we're building, I'm astounded by the quality of people, the passion that the people have for the industry, and, you know, the people I'm partnering with. I mean, it's just amazing. And if we can keep doing that, and we can keep getting this many really talented, smart, creative, ethical people into the business, that to me is the winning strategy. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, folks, we're going to end our formal panel, but we're going to stay on stage because we're sure you have some questions. We're going to open things up for a little thing we call Q&A. Um, do we have microphones and, or, well, it's a small theater. If you have a question, please just stand up and start shouting. Uh, just kidding, please raise your hand. Oh, please, go ahead. Sure. So for us, we've seen the value in maintaining um, that one-on-one -on -one relationship and rapport that you build with, with a customer uh, and a consumer. And we understand that when you transition into an adult use market, uh, you might see just more and more people and how do you keep up with maintaining those relationships and ultimately it just has to remain uh, in the forefront and as a focus for the company. Um, we are very medically oriented at the core and I hope that that's something we, we never lose because we recognize there's always a place for that and, and it is so important. So um, ultimately our part of our mission and part of our brand will be to do, to maintain that um, and have individual conversations with consumers and provide uh, an opportunity, maybe if it's not right then and there, but for a follow-up question, uh, question or consultation or conversation. Um, it just has to be part of the plan. You know, I'd say it's, it's, it's going to be a, a, a decision that we're going to need to make as a company to incur the higher costs of having potentially a better informed staff uh, more staff on site, and that decision is, is that long-term accretive to your value or short-term accretive to your value? I think we'll continue to think that the long-term accretion is more important than the short-term bump that you have on not wanting to spend the money to have those types of professionals in your organization, especially at the retail level. Eric, uh, my name is Bob Lewis. I had the fortune of speaking to Jim, your partner, uh, about uh, six months ago. One of the questions I have is every conference I go to, the dis discussion comes up about consumer education. And I stand ready to say, can you uh, see a solution where there's a public-facing communication strategy that the industry can back that you know would allow messaging to be shared with consumers across the board, because uh, I, I absolutely think that's the one missing piece, is a, a PSA strategy and activation of all the cannabis industry together supporting 
sort of like a nonprofit almost, you know, acting as a voice for the industry. Is that something you could see b being beneficial to all? Absolutely. Yeah, and something that we're actively doing now too is uh, from state to state engaging the various medical pros that we have in our organization and really increasing the communication so they can have that knowledge share and develop a platform so that information is more readily available to the public. You know, when I speak to Dr. Laszlo Metzler, one of the things that he keeps saying is cannabis has left the medical professionals behind that partly because the medical community really hasn't embraced cannabis. And so I think it's a mixture of not just having that type of non nonprofit organization, but I think we also need to get the medical community to start to back what cannabinoids in general can, can do and how they can be part of your wellness regime. And I think that's gonna take a long time. Um, and I see the, the uphill battle that uh, Dr. Metzler has because he is out there in the forefront publishing on cannabis, pu publishing on, on, on disease states that have had uh, really positive results. And it's, it's still a very skeptical medical audience that he's talking to. Any more questions? We have one more. Okay, hold on. Following up on the medical aspect, uh, Blythe, this question is for you. What is the criteria for your medical professional staffing? I mean, do they have any formal cannabis training, which is pretty much non-existent at the academic level? Sure. So um, in Pennsylvania specifically, the medical pros who uh, work in facilities have to go through a uh, CME course specifically geared towards cannabis. So it is required uh, with the Department of Health. Uh, also, in order to work in a dispensary, whether you're a medical professional or not, um, even for us to be affiliated with an organization, we have to go through a three-hour uh, training course that the Department of Health in the state has created to make sure that we understand not only how to operate, but we know the um, the basics of, of medicine and how cannabis is medicine. And then beyond that, um, we think it's incredibly important that any of our medical pros also go through an in-house training that we've developed. Um, so we're really looking for medical pros who are incredibly passionate about it. Um, I know one of ours, for example, will always share a story about how she was working in a pharmacy and people would come in and ask questions and she was starting to become so involved in cannabis just through her own self-study that in her mind, people would ask her questions and she knew she was supposed to respond about you know the pharmaceutical drug but she was talking about or in her mind having a dialogue about which cannabis products would really benefit this patient and so for her that was when she finally just had to you know make the transition into the medical cannabis space so um, yeah I mean it's it's a great question there is training that's required and courses that are required in Pennsylvania, but internally uh, we require it as well because they really are, I mean, their role is so important. They're talking about the different uh, contraindications you can have with, with your meds that you're currently taking or how you can uh, get off meds that you're currently taking and use cannabis as an alternative. So really important. Um, Deborah, do we have any more time or? Uh, Really, oh, one, one quick one. One more quick one, folks. Hi, um, I'm wondering if um, you are collecting any data from consumer uh, transactions and interactions, and how are you using that to both educate consumers and, uh, as well as educate your, your staff? Um, so we do have restrictions placed on us with the Department of Health on uh, what type of information we can actually collect from patients and um, utilize, but ultimately um, 
we are constantly looking at uh, what conditions people are coming in and being treated for. Uh, we have, we've developed something similar to a soap note uh, in the medical industry that we refer to as the hemp note. Uh, so we're able to go through with the patient and understand uh, their current health, what drugs they're currently taking, what um, ailments they're looking to alleviate, and what type of end result they're looking for. So uh, we, we have those hemp notes and we're reviewing them with our medical pros on a regular basis to really have an understanding of, of what products are working and for what conditions. And then um, we always, we like to geek out in the stores um, and talk about what we've learned from our patients or from our own personal use. And so those hemp notes are really, um, really useful because we can look back at just internally what, what we've treated various patients with. And it, and it helps us as a whole when we've got a new patient coming in uh, and knowing what to recommend. Um, and then as I, I touched on earlier too, we really are increasing that knowledge share that we do across the state lines uh, and working with Dr. Metchler and Dent and learning from him and what he's experienced and our medical pros uh, visiting him as well. And just increasing communication and talking about it. Yeah, I, I, would, I would argue that we have one of the most formidable databases on medical outcomes uh, related to cannabinoids used on various disease states. Uh, now, there are many restrictions around what we can and cannot do with that, but we are continually looking at that, doing, doing studies on it, and we think that that is going to be an incredibly valuable part of our, our, uh, our business model going forward in, in using that. But the, the restrictions around it are, are immense and difficult and it's a whole separate discussion. But you know, we are very focused on trying to become smarter and better at creating uh, products that can really help our patients. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can't thank you enough for being such a fantastic audience. Please give it up for our panelists, Eric and Blythe, and give it up one more time for Deborah and Green Market Summit. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank Thanks, you. Brian. We actually have a panel at 1 o'clock that's sponsored by Akerna talking about data and brands. So uh, right after lunch, we'll be hitting on a lot of that with uh, the data that they've been able to um, get from you know, seed to sale, tracking and such, and it's pretty, pretty fascinating what they're starting to do with that information.